if you've ever craved an extremely deep conversation that includes talk about the law of attraction or about ghosts or about the mysteries of the universe the information related to all these things has been present in indian culture for centuries but it's hidden within all the ancient scriptures that our culture has to offer the scriptures written in sanskrit the bhagavad gita the garud puran all these books many books that you may not even have heard of today on the show we have one of the most special souls that have come across one of the most knowledgeable human beings that have come across he goes by the name of gor goranga das prabhu he's a monk affiliated with iskon he's dedicated his entire life to learning unearthing and sharing the knowledge that's hidden in ancient indian culture you will need to listen to this podcast or watch this podcast more than once because it's extremely heavy remember guys this is just part 1 of this special conversation i do recommend that before you head into this episode you listen to the conversation we had with gor gopal das prabhu last year before the lockdown even began that's sort of the precursor to this particular conversation this one's way heavier that one was a much more healing form of this conversation remember guys our goal with the renvi show is to always bring you progressively heavier content and i promise you it's going to keep getting heavier from here on this conversation was very close to my heart and i hope you guys enjoy it i also hope that you guys follow us on spotify the renvi show is a spotify exclusive now every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world This is part one of our very special conversation with Gor Goranga Das Prabhu. So much has been learned in this one. I cannot wait for you guys to experience this the way I experienced it. Enjoy yourselves. Goranga Das ji thank you for being on the Ranveer show thank you so much Ranveer for having me on this show thank you very much just being in your presence is giving me a lot of peace <laughs> so i'm looking forward to this conversation uh, honestly these kind of conversations with people who are blessed i feel happen to me when i need them the most it's it's more hits in this but it's more of a selfish thing for me like i feel <laughs> i feel honored i feel like i'm going to get some of the answers i was in the search for sir Has this ever happened to you when you were younger? Definitely, because I was always very inquisitive about what's the purpose of life, and that's how I chanced upon the Gita and met people. So, that's the purpose of human life: to ask the right questions and get the right answers. Yes. So, so um, I think people on social media would have definitely heard of Jai Shetty. What they don't know is that even Jai Shetty's journey began with conversations like this with you. um you know before he got on to social media yes i want to actually dial back even further than that so what's your story like when you were in your early 20s yeah, yeah. where did it begin yeah i was studying at iit mumbai and you know i had some friends who were really into the bhagavad gita and uh, i was always intrigued about uh, death you know as you know that every profession in this world is solving some problem doctor is solving the problem of health engineer is solving problems related to you know various kinds of issues people are facing so then i was wondering uh, where do the spiritualists the temples where do they fall in this entire gamut of activities what problems do they solve then when i came across the gita i realized that all spiritual traditions are ultimately working towards the common goal of trying to solve the problem of death okay so that was something astonishing and hit me like anything and uh, that's how my journey began in the fourth year of iit so can you explain that like what exactly about death did you discover yeah so as you know that uh, there is a life we lead till death and then beyond death what happens so all of the current uh, secular education is focused on how we can try to uh, resolve issues till death but all our spiritual traditions are focusing that how there is a soul within which can travel beyond death hmm. 
so just like you have make my trip mm -hmm. so you begin with your destination and begin with your current place so all spiritual traditions irrespective of names denominations languages have five things in common i call it spirituality 101 okay the first is where you are where is your consciousness currently point number 2 is where you want to go what is your destination point number 3 is what is the experience you are expecting on reaching your destination as part of your journey of the soul fourth is what is the path you want to take mm. in that journey and fifth is what are the obstacles you will face in that path so all traditions deal with these five questions only and as you change the details of one of these parameters the name of the tradition the name of the religion will change yes sir so these basic things i uh, experienced when i started studying the bhagavad gita so i think at that age 22 23 mark there are a lot of people who go through somewhat of a spiritual transformation i don't know if there's a spiritual reason for that <laughs> it happens at that age um it happened to me as well um but in 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 those years 22 to 25 i never thought of taking a monkhood i mean actually that thought did cross my head a few times <laughs> because when i talk to people like yourself i see so much peace in your eyes and i see so much happiness in your eyes and i feel like you know that's that's maybe what's missing from the human race in general <laughs> but anyway when people are at that 22 23 age bracket they never think of i'll become a monk they think of okay i'll go down the spiritual path so so what happened with you where you decided that okay no i'm going to take a monkhood right so you know in india there are 15 lakh uh, engineering graduates who come out every year and uh, it's a fact that uh, you know majority of them they do uh, jobs and do businesses but a few of them also land back in engineering colleges as professors so similarly mm -hmm. bhagavad gita originally was spoken to arjuna who was a warrior but then a few people also are inspired to dedicate their lives to teach the gita hmm. so i got inspired by the fact that well india has you know almost 27 crore students in first to 12 standard and 3 crore in colleges but uh, i don't see that they are actually getting the clarity with respect to the message of the gita so let me do my bit by sharing this message uh, with the people and so i dedicated my life to uh, spreading the message and teaching the bhagavad gita otherwise the gita is meant for the whole world to practice it in their own lives and uh, you know as jay has written a book think like a monk hmm. so the idea is that gita is promoting the consciousness of uh, living with the spirit of detachment compassion and service irrespective of whatever may be your external profession and occupation yes so i think most people associate the gita with being religious uh, but it's actually a life guide as of what i have understood you know when we spoke to guru gol gor gopal das ji um the kind of outcome of that was it's just a guide to life so so um i'd love to ask you you know about your beginnings with that book in terms of was there anything you read in the gita that really shifted things for you as a youth like when you were 22 because i know you were in the search for answers about death <laughs> but uh, any anything that just shifted yes. your mindset yeah there is one specific verse in bhagavad gita which uh, really uh, brought out this concept very strongly especially about how in spite of the fact that things change within around us there are certain things which do not change and in the second chapter krishna says dehi no smin yatha dehe kaumaram yauvanam jara tatha dehantara praptir dhiras tatra na muhyati so as you have uh, spoken about gita being a, a religious or a way of life that debate is happening happening endlessly but you know basically the whole idea of uh, religion and spirituality is all about helping a person understand their journey of the soul in life and beyond life so it all depends on how you look at things when we experience physical pain we go to a hospital when we experience mental and emotional pain in vedic india we had hospitals known as mandir 
which means hospital for the mind. So therefore, you know, when I read this particular verse, I realized that this verse says the body goes through multiple changes. When you are one year old, five year old, 10 year old, 20 year old, 40 year old, 80 year old. But although your body is changing physically, the soul within is not changing. Hmm. Because even now when I am uh, talking to you, you are referring to when you were 21 years old, <laughs> when you were 18 years old, when you were five years old. So there is an unchanging you and an unchanging I, which makes me share things with you as if I have been the unchanging witness of all those changes around me. Mm. So all these religious traditions and religious texts like the Bhagavad Gita, you know, they speak about how the soul does not change as the body changes because the greatest fear and anxiety people go through as 300 million people globally are going through anxiety and stress. One of the greatest causes for that fear is the fear of change which is thrust upon us beyond our control and against our will. So all these spiritual traditions and these religious books, they help cope with that fear, saying that, hey, there is something which is not changing at all. And nothing in this creation can make that change, your own existence as a spiritual being, the soul. Are we in spiritual times, sir? Like, this whole situation we're going through for the last one and a half years with COVID. What is happening? Like, I mean, all of us are collectively going through this as souls. So many people have lost family members. So many people have seen suffering. Uh, we even seeing natural calamities like all over the world, freak accidents. My take on it is that something is definitely happening. My spiritual take on it is I wish to learn. <laughs> So just what is your opinion, whatever is happening around us? Sir? Yeah, thank you, Ranbir, for that uh, very pertinent question. I'm glad that, you know, you have such a, a deep, positive perspective on learning from situations. And that is precisely, uh, you know, what the Bhagavad Gita is talking about, saying that, you know, there are going to be always three types of distresses which human beings will experience. It's called Adi Daivik, Adi Bhautik, Adhyatmik. And it is part of the design of the system. So basically, when you are in a system, when you are dealing with your laptop, you should know how the laptop will function. So all of these spiritual literatures, like the Bhagavad Gita, are like manuals, mm -hmm. which are given with the working of the world to help us understand that. So Adi Daivik refers to supernatural calamities which come, floods, earthquakes, various kinds of uh, you know distresses which uh, are due to natural calamities. Second is Adi Bhautik, distresses which are caused by other living entities. That includes the diseases, that includes various kinds of crimes which are committed, that includes wars. Third is Adhyatmik, miseries which are caused from within and people experiencing depression, anxiety, stress. So all these three are going to be concomitant factors of life in this world. And therefore, all these uh, spiritual texts help us cope with all of these external changes while trying to maintain our equanimity and equilibrium. So you are perfectly right that, you know, over the last one, one and a half years, what the world has seen is extremely shocking extremely bewildering and uh, you know it's a time for the whole world to introspect that um, nature is kind of giving a pushback you know there is a limit to how much we can exploit nature and go against nature and uh, there is a certain way in which the message has been conveyed and we need to really introspect and uh, try to transform our own habits because ultimately discipline is the fusion between intention and action mm. and we have to begin with self-discipline. So in my view, this is the message from Mother Nature loud and clear that, hey, wake up guys and you know try to reform yourself the way you are living life on this world, in yes. this earth. Yes, sir. And I feel it's all about excesses on humanities and excesses with 
materialism with uh, maybe killing other beings with maybe hurting other human beings for that matter uh which was sort of the spiritual transformation i had at maybe age 25 again i'm going back <laughs> and observing uh my own ages through the years um at age 25 i really discovered i think spiritualism in a deeper way and i had interactions with monks like yourself and what i'd always see is a lot of peace in their eyes in the same way that i see so much peace in your eyes so um is there something about the monk lifestyle over the years that just kind of gives you that nectar of peace <laughs> like i wish to know what that is is it sure. is it wisdom is it yeah. the stuff you're reading in the book is it the people around you um in this i've spoken to you now other than the podcast probably for like 15 minutes prior to the show as well and the only time i saw peace leaving your eyes was when you were describing the suffering in the world <laughs> so my my take on that is that a true monk always lives for the world and lives right. for the ones around him and if that is your purpose then you are supposed to emit peace emit positivity happiness uh but if you do see suffering out there that's where you go into slight action mode but please correct me if i'm wrong <laughs> sir i think you're getting the distilled wisdom of all the spiritual literatures you know absolutely uh, in the right direction wonderful to hear that ranbir and i think uh, what you have mentioned is very true that there is a mysterious simultaneous existence of joy and sorrow within a spiritualist's heart by the strength of the personal practice of spirituality we experience joy but mysteriously the more we experience that joy the more we become aware of others distresses hmm so this is the very mystical simultaneous existence of joy and sorrow within the heart of a compassionate soul and such a compassionate soul is known as vaishnav para dukha dukhi technically What means mean? para dukha is the distress of others causes him suffering dukhi so therefore this is a very very important uh, principle which you have brought out that across the world there is no shortage of resources but if each person is able to control himself or herself more and experience that transformation in joy and become full in terms of their own personal experience then they are more in a mood to give than to grab and take mm. so coming back to your original question on what makes uh, monks feel more peaceful is that uh, typically every person in this world the story of the world material world and story of our life can be encapsulated in terms of eight items which is there in the shrimad bhagavatam and all of us are struggling morning till night in this world for these eight only atma body jaya wife suta children agara house pashu vehicles dravina money bandhushu acceptance from society rajya is control over one's career and progress so this is the story so those who are monks they decide to live a life which is free from the influence of the seven out of eight hmm. so then they are left only with atma which is maintaining their body for the purpose of spiritual elevation wow so when you don't have the seven out of eight so you are 88% <laughs> load less <laughs> so when you are walking with 88% less load naturally you can smile more hmm. so that's the only idea <laughs> very stupid question for you sir as a follow up when you are in a car and there's nothing happening no one's talking to you um you know you're just looking outside you're looking at the trees what's going on in your head i think of uh, lord chaitanya's verse which says trinadapi sunichena tarori vasahishnuna amanina manadena kirtaniya sadahari let us become humbler than a blade of grass more tolerant like a tree ready to give all respect to others and expecting none in return so the tree is actually 
you have beautifully brought out this point is one of the most significant you know um, items glorified in the bhagavatam when krishna looks at the trees in vrindavan he says look at these trees they are an emblem of parupkar of doing good for others because vat varsha atap himan sahanto varayanti na they tolerate heat they tolerate rains they tolerate all kinds of things in recent cyclone you saw they tolerate but they try to protect others so then krishna says that this is my definition of what is the paradigm of success in life etavat janma safalyam this is the success in life why pranair arther dhiya vacha shreya acharan when with our prana with our wealth with our intelligence with our words we are trying to benefit others so the trees are a symbol of total dedication for compassionate service to others trees are something that i've been very drawn to the more i meditate the more i'm drawn to trees my team knows that like they make fun of this also but i don't know it's something that's always happened so um going to ask you something slightly deeper um there's a concept of maya i've been reading about in the western world we call it the concept of simulation that we're all living in one big virtual reality simulation uh what does the gita say about maya so and uh, i'm also asking from the perspective of as a individual soul yeah what do you do with the maya because yeah. that's all those concepts of law of attraction maybe even prayer maybe even compassion towards other living beings all right. kinds of living beings right. not just human beings um all that kind of fits into maya according to me and right. that's what i've been studying for the last two or three years right and i have seen situations where let's just say beings from the other side of the maya come out and give you a helping hand <laughs> or you know energies within maya kind of mold the maya in your favor uh basically you can kind of steer your own life through your actions and your thoughts but i'd love to know the actual spiritual perspective sir it's a beautiful question and uh, you know i think you have been studying a lot of spirituality recently based on you know the kind of questions you're asking i mean i mean i guess so. <laughs> like it's 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 the one um it's the one place i get to do my true heart's calling which is probably become a monk but uh, I don't know just I feel God's put me in a position to be able to be a cool dude on screen <laughs> so I've got to continue with this career but I'd probably I'd probably be a monk in another lifetime Definitely I think you already have the the right mindset of uh, thinking deeply and uh, thinking compassionately in terms of how to benefit the world and I think that's more important and the world needs uh, people uh, with such consciousness more and more and uh, coming back to maya i'll give just uh, one example simple example to give you an idea so maya literally translates as illusion that which is not ma means not ya means that which is so maya the word means that which is not so imagine that you know i am sitting in a truck or there is a you know there is a truck which is parked there is no driver in the inside that truck and there is a rope i try around the back side of the truck and you know i tie that rope around my waist and then i am standing there you know trying to pull the truck at that time the driver comes in sits in the truck puts a reverse gear and then the truck comes towards me <laughs> and then i am still pulling it and as the truck starts coming towards me i start saying see i pull the truck i pull the truck so am i pulling the truck you know i am just placing my hands on the rope but actually there is another energy which is pulling so that is an illusion now then the driver puts first gear and starts taking the truck forward mm. and i'm trying to hold the truck i don't have the power so the moving truck drags me along and then i start you know crying out i am defeated i am finished i am lost i couldn't handle this so the idea was even when there was no driver in the truck i didn't have that power 
when the driver put the reverse gear and brought the truck near me, I didn't have the power. And then when the truck started moving, I didn't have that power. I had some power, but not that power which I assume I have. So that is the idea that in this world, all of us have some limited capacity to do things. Right? So Bhagavad Gita speaks about five factors which make work happen. First is the body. Second is your identity. Depending on your identity, like someone has an identity of a doctor, so that will give him a certain intention. You know, you have an identity as a podcaster, as a social media influencer. I have an identity as a monk. So we all have our identities that modulates our intention. Then third is the instruments, which is the senses and the various things which we can gather. Fourth is the effort, the actual effort we put. And the fifth, Bhagavad Gita says, is something which is not usually you know, factored, which is daivam or destiny or the will of the Supreme. When all these four and the fifth come together, then things happen. So therefore, Gita speaks about the Supreme Lord, the Jiva soul and material energy. That material energy Krishna calls as Maya. Wow. Okay. So therefore, Jiva is the desirer. So he desires. So we are the, des we are the controllers in terms of desiring. Just like I desire. Let me, you know, type a page of Word document. So then based on that, I type, but I type it into the computer. Then that computer processes it and then I desire, I want to print it. So I print, I press on the print button, but the computer is connected to the printer. So the Supreme is the Paramatma, as they say, he processes our desire. And at this moment, he is processing my desire that I want to lift my hand. So he's saying on this particular date at this time, does he have the sufficient karma to fulfill that? And if he says yes, then based on the sanction, then material energy in terms of nature is given that power. And then I'm able to lift my hand. But maybe in future, a time may come when I may desire, but I'm still not able to fulfill that desire. Mm -hmm. What has changed is that. So therefore... If I look at the printer and say, print, 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 and shout at the printer, the printer is not going to print. There is something in between me and the printer which is needed to connect. Mm. So printer is the Maya, I am the Jiva, and the computer and the processor is the Supreme Lord, Paramatma. And that's what the Gita fascinatingly connects all of this. Mm. So you also mentioned destiny here. Uh, can destiny be changed? Yes, definitely. Through karmas? So, uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that uh, kim karma kim akarmeti kavyopyatra mohita that what is karma and how to overcome this karma is something which can be bewildering. So, karma can be overcome. What is karma is the acts which we perform uh, under the influence of the time factor and uh, there is someone who is following the rules of the you know, government properly. So he will get certain result. Someone gets into a criminal mentality, he'll get another result. So therefore, if someone is having a certain kind of karma, Krishna says that if you become part of the government, just like even in law, when there is a bandit or a criminal, you know, who surrenders, then a certain kind of pardon is given, mm. even in law. Mm. It is seen. And in the past, there have been, you know, instances when I was growing up, I would read about this chumble decoits and, you know, many of them surrendered and they got some reprieve. So like that, the same arrangement is made that if we decide to transform and change, then the karmic results are kind of purified. Mm. So that is all described in great detail in the Bhagavad Gita. So what I understand is the choice to transform along with compassion, along with doing good work 
and i'd also love to add along with some form of practice like yes. meditation uh maybe that's the core of changing your own kar- karmas firstly right. and when your karmas start becoming more and more positive when you do good work in the world when right. you treat people well when you practice your life with discipline uh that eventually along with the effort you put in your material career can change your destiny so right. someone's like why have things not worked out for me why have things not worked out for me rather than like blaming the world or blaming someone else just figure out how to tighten these screws and i've seen this with myself also right. repeatedly right um i think last year during the first lockdown by june or july a bunch of us had got cabin fever you know you're locked in one place yeah. and social media especially was had become very intense um i'd seen the last dance with michael jordan it's about michael jordan's life he's a he's a legendary basketball player okay and i also studied a lot of other internationally renowned athletes uh tyson fury is a boxer mike tyson for that matter um and i was inspired by them for sure for mm-hmm. the amount of effort they put in um like i believe i'm like a, i have a warrior spirit in my heart so when you see another warrior doing things in the real world even you're inspired right and you try to imbibe those qualities um all of them were maybe 90% amazing people mm. and maybe there were 10% flaws like there are with everybody but Absolutely. i feel when you're that kind of a warrior where you're fighting so hard you're putting in so much of yourself blood sweat tears effort mental focus all that uh your flaws might get a little heightened and the one common a common flaw i saw with all these super achievers was that they always believe that they are the only reason for their success where it was like no you know you did this i am the best i am the i trained day and night i did this i did that and i started doing that myself because they were my idols right. i was so inspired by michael jordan i would wake up every morning thinking that i'm michael jordan and definitely got more focused on work went even harder and before the podcast i told you about all the good stuff that's happening in my career right. that is an outcome of that phase as well where i got motivated to go that extra mile in terms of effort right instead of working 20 hours a day i was working 22 hours you know it just it went even further and then there was also this element of i am doing it me me it's being caused by me i know what i'm talking about and my close people came and told me no no something is going wrong yeah <laughs> finally i did one podcast with my mother actually she kind of said just one line which just burst my bubble she said that not all success is your own and not all failure is your own either so that line of not all failure is your own stayed with me because these same people when they are thanking themselves for their own success right. if they even see somewhat of a glitch or a blip then they again start blaming themselves completely and that's what actually leads to dark phases in the mind so so what do you have to say about this i mean and this isn't just american athletes or yeah, yeah. european athletes it happens in human culture yes that's what ego is that's what arrogance is that <laughs> you think that everything that's come your way the money the exactly. fame the love it's all you but you never know i think you you raised an excellent point with a very beautiful realization you know i must say and you know as you took the name of michael jordan i want to reflect on the exact same parallel in in the form of a, a warrior and successful warrior athlete arjun when he was growing up practicing in dronacharya's you know academy dronacharya had given a standing instruction never feed arjuna food in the dark so everyone was intrigued why is he saying like this one evening arjuna was eating his dinner there was a lamp and a gust of wind blew and the lamp blew out it became pitch dark arjuna continued eating arjuna thought oh there is no light around it's pitch dark i'm still able to eat my hand is finding its way to the mouth if i can eat in the dark i can practice in the dark from that day onwards arjuna stopped sleeping at night he would practice in the day have a dinner practice all through the night so one of arjuna's name is gudakesh so what level of diligence and focus so that arjuna who had a sterling record of 100% success in all his combats when on the battlefield of kurukshetra when he saw duryodhan he was ready to fight but when krishna brought his chariot in front of bhishma arjuna 
this is my grandfather drona oh this is my guru so arjuna got confused that a grandfather is supposed to be loved a teacher is supposed to be respected a warrior is supposed to kill his enemy an enemy is supposed to be killed so arjuna got confused between three identities am i a warrior a grandson or a student that conflict within paralyzed arjuna and he put his gandiva in front of krishna and said i cannot fight so krishna looked at arjuna and thought dronacharya has taught him weapons to fight with the world but you have to first conquer over the battle within then you can go for the battle without because inevitably you will come across circumstances outside you will not be able to negotiate and put things in perspective and so the gita was spoken by arjuna by krishna to arjuna for one hour so before a very intense serious battle was going to happen arjuna invested one hour of his time to hear the gita to understand that oh i am speaking non violence krishna is saying what non violence you are saying i will fight you are saying i will not fight but my fight is with that i krishna said and therefore krishna told any two people have a relationship the unspoken pattern within that relationship is i will control the other person and make them dance as per my will that is violence so krishna is saying arjun you are speaking about non violence in every family in every relationship there is violence and that violence is caused by that feeling that i am the controller i am the proprietor i am the enjoyer real non violence would be to abandon and purify that illusion that consciousness that maya so krishna spoke the gita to arjuna and arjuna fought now with a transformed consciousness the occupation remained same but the consciousness became totally different otherwise so many fighters were there but why is arjuna glorified because he spoke he fought with a certain consciousness which was he was in the world but not of the world because he had elevated and transformed perfect so can you explain this from a modern day perspective in terms of i understand you're going out and fighting in right. the world um but how do you actually transform your own consciousness right as you know that any kind of transformation needs intervention if there is a a tumor in the body it needs intervention surgical intervention if there is a virus in a software it needs a software intervention similarly if there is a virus in the hard hard disk of our mind in the form of this false ego that i am the proprietor i am the enjoyer so you need an antivirus software mm. for the mind mm. that in our traditional vedic culture was known as mantra man means mind tra means that which has the power and potency to transform the mind so what is plaguing the mind currently i am the center of the universe i am the controller i am the enjoyer i can do it when you add mantra in your life those were the anti virus softwares which would purify that mind of such illusory tendencies and conceptions and then a person looks at the world with a different perspective he sees that just like you feel very close to your brother and your sister and to your because of the common origin we are all coming from the common parents so when we help people see that we are all coming from a common origin our perspective towards everyone changes and that's what in traditional india was known as vasudhaiv kutumbakam that we look at the entire world as one family one positive aspect if we may uh, look at it in the in terms of this current pandemic is that you know irrespective of nationalities you know across the world people have got an opportunity to express their humanity in these times of crisis 
and we could see that irrespective of political alignments and various things when people saw the suffering that innate compassion literally came out and people you know went out of their way to try to support and help in various ways so in today's context when you add a practice which involves some kind of a spiritual intervention and personally you know i have been practicing the spiritual intervention of mantra meditation there may be other forms of meditation so meditation is something which is growing a lot and uh, i think you know as uh, influencers like your good self and others should try to encourage and inspire the youth that uh, as they spend a quality time for their physical fitness uh, one element of fitness is also the mind because who defines good health as a combination of uh, body mind and spirit mm. so that would be a very important element that's what a holistic health would look like i think more and more people are embracing meditation i am working on level with harshil garya a common friend so um and we're trying to figure out ways to get more people to meditate the big challenge we're facing with gen z uh, you know kids born after say 98 99 the big challenge there is um, they think they don't need meditation because they can do other stuff in that much time <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i mean we've been we've been taking feedback from a lot of people it's 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 a challenge getting gen z to meditate but they're more open than i was at that age yeah which gives me hope that at least they're open to listening I used to be the kid in college used to make fun of meditators and <laughs> fun of people who did yoga and all this and I'm this person now. <laughs> so it's it's like you know when when you hit again that 22 23 age bracket you're hit with the realization of the nature of life. Right. And you you definitely need that little time period to switch off which probably in college you get through mm. sometimes you know your intoxicants sometimes your friends sometimes right. your fun time. uh but in adulthood and the more adult i become the more i realize that my fun time is spent in complete isolation the more isolation the better family great uh, alone amazing alone in my mind even better <laughs> so uh that's that's a message i think that will be put out there so but when we are meditating or studying spiritual practices something that fascinates me a lot um just in the world of spiritual studies and this isn't spoken about too much on the internet mm. is um you know the slightly hatke side of spiritual stuff mm-hmm. so by that i mean the sci-fi like things we read about you know and these are questions we get a lot astral projections out of body experiences uh the soul's journey after death heaven and hell uh these concepts which are written about in stories right. but i'd actually like to know whatever your perspective is on any of these Maybe I'll begin with a simple question, which a lot of people wish to know: uh, What are ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you for uh, bringing forth uh, many of these points, and I loved your perspective on the Gen Z. But I also agree that uh, one of the most positive things about that generation is they are quite purpose-driven, hmm. more than you know what I can imagine. You know, I was when I was just you know in school and stuff like that. so let's look at the positive and as you rightly said this is the best way to kind of integrate so as far as ghosts are concerned uh, the bhagavad gita speaks about three levels of existence one is the soul within then the second is the subtle body called mind intelligence and ego above that is the gross body consisting of earth water fire air ether so these eight elements five gross earth water fire air ether gross elements gross body subtle body mind intelligence ego and the soul within so the soul is trapped within this mm. so when the soul leaves the body the gross body is left behind but the subtle body carries the soul to the next body tatha dehantara praptir so sometimes when someone has misused their gross body or as per their karma they still have some time before a gross body can be allotted like accidental death or yeah there could be various reasons for mm. that you know i i can only say one thing that if you have defaulted mm. you know in a particular way in uh, some job and then it's a red mark so then you are sp- you spend time unemployed 
because wherever you go they see that record and you don't get employment so easily so like that if there has been a misuse of the body in certain way in terms of especially you know hurting oneself on one on one's own and things like that and there are various causes are given in the garuda puran especially if you want a detailed description especially the the journey post death is described in great detail in the garuda puran so then that subtle body with that soul is traveling around and looking for uh, a vehicle so okay. then they enter into these different bodies and possess them and that's what the the concept of ghost is all about when when you so, say subtle bodies is it the same as saying astral bodies so uh, subtle body in uh, sanskrit is known as sukshma deha so right now what the modern uh, scientists are referring to as astral bodies from other you know places universes and you know coming like that so there could be bodies made out of fire and ether and things like that in other planes that is the astral body but here the subtle body is the body of mind intelligence and ego covering every soul mm. so these are a lot of fascinating details described in the bhagavad gita and as i said you know uh, basically tourism industry is quite famous you know india is get pre covid got 11 million tourists and northern ireland got 5 million tourists with only 1 million population so people love traveling mm. so the gita describes about all the planetary systems in which that travel is possible depending on your preference where you want to go how you want to go wow so the whole fundamental basis of bhagavad gita is the only possession you and me possess is our desire and intention and that is referred to as swatantrata ratna the jewel of our free will and depending on how we decide to use that or abuse that we are rewarded and punished accordingly so all spiritual practitioners are focused on intensifying their intention mm. that's the bottom line of spirituality mm. intensify your intention and that's the bottom line even for someone who wants to become you know materially successful as you yes. quoted so many examples you have an intention the difference between success and not so successful is that the intention was not so intense so it did not result in practice it did not result in action mm. so therefore when we intensify our intention to be a servant of the supreme and be self disciplined and practice it and share our compassion with others then automatically we experience that transformation so various levels of subtlety are experienced depending on what level you want to access yes so you spoke about intensity with intention of course i've got to make this selfish about myself <laughs> um does intensity with intention also apply to love and relationships like if you want to attract something in your life which is where the law of attraction manifestation all that comes in play and that's i think the most popular word when it comes to modern day spiritual conversation oh manifestation oh <laughs> law of attraction that's what people keep talking about i'm guessing it does play a role and i know that manifestation involves a certain degree of you putting in work towards it as well yes. for example for ma manifesting material success you put in your effort in your office or your business or whatever and for manifesting relationship success first work on yourself be that best partner to be able to attract someone uh the the question for you is a little deeper you know i'm confused between two ideologies so one ideology is don't really want something the universe will bring it to you when the time is right and the second ideology is this that put your mind on something and it will come to you now i am conflicted here sir please pull me out of my conflict <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to selflessly serving you should not wait and you should jump into it so therefore all spiritual uh, you know the the primary the first verse of vedanta sutra is athatho brahma jigyasa don't wait that some day knowledge will come start putting effort in that direction mm. 
And Gajendra in the eighth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam says, time can destroy everything. Big empires, huge kingdoms, powerful bodies, relationships, structures. But time cannot destroy one thing. Ignorance. And therefore, all of our ancient tradition, scriptures, teachings, they inspire us to be proactive in learning and getting that knowledge and developing our relationship with the Supreme. Mm. And in that context, you will connect with many. And then, depending on how you progress, different people will come and connect with you. Mm. So you must be extremely focused and proactive in developing your relationship with the Supreme in the human form. And then you should be extremely focused and proactive while trying to serve other human beings in your perspective of seeing them as his parts, not with the view to exploit them mm. and enjoy them mm. and demonstrate proprietorship over them. And then in that mood when you do, then you should not at all be obsessed about the adulation and the adoration and the profit, and even if no one comes to know about what you're doing, the very fact that you have done your bit to serve, that is a supreme satisfaction. And that's what Krishna says. Karmanye vadi karaste. There you go. <laughs> you're also a Gita scholar. <laughs> no, 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 no. So I've just I've just seen a lot of BR Chopra's Mahabharat. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm, uh, this Karmanye vadi karaste Mahapaleshu Kadachana is a very crucial part of my transformation. Uh, another mentor of mine, two mentors of mine actually. I don't know if you know Mr. Kiran Khalap, sir. He's also been on the podcast. You do? I, I've heard about him. Okay. And uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan Pillai. They both kind of hammered this thought into my head because I think, I don't, I don't remember why. I believe it was the person I was with at that time. I did become materially driven, um, which is when I realized this time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's not about associating yourself with, oh, I want to come in the newspapers and I want to be famous and I want to be rich. It's not about that. It's about doing the universe's work in the world, being a good person. Even, even if you're not rich and famous, it's about giving positivity to those three, four people around you. And that right. matters more than, you know, earning a million dollars just for yourself. Mm. Um, I mean, again, so like I have to bring you back to the questions about love, because I know that there's a lot of people watching <laughs> this. Uh, is there a concept like soulmates at all in the Gita? Or uh, like what what is said about a union of a of of two souls? Yeah, it's a beautiful question, and uh, I would uh, since I've spoken a lot about Gita, I want to also speak a little bit about Ramayana. Sure. And there's a lot of excitement about the Ram Temple and Ayodhya and everything. So, you know, I want to speak about three things. One is principles. Second is people. And third is purpose. So, there are four principles which are described in Ramayana. First is integrity, represented by Lord Ram. Honesty means to speak what you have done, but integrity is to do what you have spoken. So, Ram represented that. He could have avoided going to the forest, but he said, no, obedience, integrity. Lakshman so he, Ram represents Dharma. Lakshman represents Artha. So what is the meaning of the word Lakshman? Lakshmano Lakshmi Sampanno Bahir Prana Ivapara. Lakshman word literally means one for whom the real Lakshmi or wealth is Seva, service to Ram. So Lakshman would be inseparable from Ram. When you are speaking of soulmates, they were the original, uh, you know, master and servant relationship where Lakshman just felt that this is my Bahir Prana. He is my external life force because you cannot separate your life breath. So he looked at Ram as Bahir Prana Ivapara is the external, you know, walking breath of mine. But what was the relationship based on? Selfless service. So Lakshman represents Seva 
and that seva rupi lakshmi is why we call him lakshman that he considered as a greater opulence than the opportunity to enjoy the opulence of ayodhya the forest appeared to be more attractive to him than the comfort of the palace because he felt the real opulence in life is the opportunity to serve then we have bharat who represents moksha and bharat basically means rajya bharanat iti bharat one of the most uh, difficult experiences all of us face is being misunderstood when our intentions are misrepresented so bharat had nothing to do with ram's going to the forest he was not a part of kaikeyi's conspiracy but the circumstances were such that ayodhya vasis kaushalya bharadwaj rishi and guha they all thought he is party to this so bharat maharaj had to spend practically his whole life in the midst of people thinking that he is responsible for ram going to the forest in fact vasishta would not allow him to put fire onto the funeral pyre of dasharath maharaj saying that while dying dasharath maharaj said bharat is a villain he has conspired with kaikeyi to send ram to the forest do not allow him to touch my dead body so bharat maharaj could not even perform the funeral rites and shatrugna had to do it imagine the the weight of pain he had to carry thinking that my father left his body with that misunderstanding about me i had nothing to do genuinely in this entire episode but phas gaya so bharata represents two things one who has unlimited ability to tolerate pain and number 2 ram still made him the king of ayodhya and made him serve so he did not want that responsibility but for the pleasure of ram he did it so many times we find it difficult to tolerate insinuations accusations misunderstandings and we just feel let me walk out of this but bharat showed that real love means to be able to express your service whether you are in a popular situation or in a condemned situation and he would get up 1 o'clock in the morning and take bath in the sarayu because if after 2 o'clock the citizens of ayodhya would come near the sarayu and they see bharat they would pick up stones and hit at him that was his quality tolerance fourth shatrugna one who had conquered the shatru of ego because of which he could serve bharat the whole of ayodhya was condemning bharat but shatrugna continued serving bharat many times we are afraid of serving someone who becomes unpopular and is on the wrong side of law because we just start thinking that oh how will it reflect upon me but shatrugna was totally loyal and committed because yet he, he didn't consider about myself he considered how i can serve so therefore he represents humility so these four principles ram representing integrity lakshman representing service attitude bharat maharaj representing tolerance and shatrugna representing humility these are four integral elements required for a sustainable relationship and that sustainable relationship is what makes people remain bonded for long periods of time so principles lead to personal relationships amongst people when you manage to sustain your relationship with people for long periods of time then you can attain your purpose mm. otherwise it's going to be a very lonely journey and mm. confusing journey mm. so ramayan basically brings these three things forward that your foundation should be on principles then you have personal relationships which are deep and sustainable then you are able to actually sustain the journey of life and attain your purpose mm. so you know that's the ramayan's perspective on relationships and it should not be seen in terms of just some temporary you know selfish titillation which i get but it is based on being able to negotiate the ups and downs in life 
going through various kinds of misunderstandings and complex circumstances and that's why although ayodhya literally means that city which could not be conquered by any army the major theme of ramayan is not describing about the super excellent administration of ayodhya but it is completely centered around the tapestry of relationships amongst the family members and the people mm. and so ramayan is giving a message it's more difficult to manage our relationships in family and in formal settings than it is to manage formally structured administration mm. now look at it that way <laughs> where does sita ma fit into all this sita ma is uh, you know in one sense the most important player in this entire episode because she is the one as uh, the great uh, vaishnava acharya vedanta desika represents uh, shows that sita mata on one hand is the goddess of fortune uh, you know uh, she represents lord's eternal energy and at the same time in another sense vedanta desika says that sita mata is giving a message to the souls like all of us that till the time she was absorbed in serving ram you know she was perfectly safe but the moment her attention got distracted by the golden deer you know as soon as kind of she went in the golden deer attraction at that moment when the soul becomes distracted from his service maya or material energy who comes in the form of the five karmendriyas and five gyanendriyas the ten headed ravana represented by mind kidnaps the soul and shelters the soul imprisons the soul in the body of lanka in the midst of ocean of material existence and at that time when ram comes and sees sita is not there relationship of love are based on voluntary exchanges so ram is not sure whether sita has abandoned him or someone has taken her whether she wants to come back and reunite what exactly is the story so when you are not sure about your relationship with someone then you need an intermediary you need a third party who will bridge the communication so hanuman ji plays that role and that is the role of a guru who carries the message of the lord as ram doot and presents to sita devi that Ra- lord ram is looking for you and sita devi gives her message back i am also wanting to come back and when R- hanuman ji comes back and gives that message so lord ram is very eager along with the army so va nara basically means nara means human va means one who looks human but is actually divine one one meaning is looks like animal is an animal but looks human but another meaning is va nara also means one who is a divine personality but he looks human that is a guru they are spiritual beings they are in you know human form they are the ones who carry the message of the lord and share that message with the people and then see whoever is interested voluntarily then only a relationship of love can be established so therefore the lord has authorized the people in this world to become his agents and then they come and spread the message so they have a great responsibility of representing him or through the misbehavior misrepresenting mm. and breaking people's faith in him mm. so therefore it's a major responsibility and that's kind of the essence of uh, the ramayana in you know short so you spoke about people being agents of god of the universe one of the agents of the universe is our common friend jai shetty yeah. <laughs> i'd love for you to describe jai uh, yeah. my brother yes to the audiences before he became the jai shetty that we know of yes because i i feel he's a great representation of someone yes. who brings true wisdom yes. and gives it out to the modern world on such a big stage yes so um you know what went right for him what transformed within him things that he wouldn't say because he's too humble a guy he doesn't even talk about these things but i just want people to know what's gone on in the life of jay before he became jay shetty so jay has been a very very uh, sincere student 
of uh, spirituality and uh, he has mentioned about our meeting in the in the book i think like a monk and uh, actually i met him first in 2006 around that time and uh, you know he was so sincere in wanting to understand what are the principles of spirituality that he would uh, you know attend so many of my discourses and we would have long conversations and even sometimes uh, he would be driving me around and asking questions and i must uh, you know one thing which many of you may not know that uh, he has one of the best handwriting amongst anyone i have seen the way he would take notes mm. you know it was so systematic so organized which uh, really made me uh, very impressed that you know he has a very clear thought process the clarity which he had in his understanding was amazing and uh, because of his genuine sincerity and humility he was very young and at that time he was all he was already an influencer even when he was you know not in his current social media influencer uh, profile but you know so many youth were connected to him and he was like a leader uh, in terms of his uh, thought process and uh, so many of the things which he saw which we were doing at uh, mumbai you know he tried to do similar things in you know wherever he was doing in london and other places and uh, one of the things which uh, really i did not expect was uh, he would actually come and become a monk so i really asked him a few times are you sure you know because um, you are so young so good looking and uh, you have your whole career in front of you why do you want to do this but he was really wanting to uh, go deeper into the spiritual aspects and uh, practice and understand and get a complete perspective of things inside out so you know when he was in the monastery you know we don't treat anyone as a rock star so he had to do everything which you know uh, people are expected to do in a monastery including you know cleaning the trash you know helping in cooking and whatever other things so this is all part of the training because in the bhagavad gita krishna says krishna mentions 20 points of knowledge in the 13th chapter of gita from verse 9 to 13 it begins with amanitvam adambitvam ahimsa kshanti rajyam so amanitvam means humility adambitvam means pridelessness these are the first two items of knowledge so when a person is in that mood of hum- being humble and prideless then he can soak in the spiritual knowledge so i have been serving with his holiness radhanath swami maharaj from 1993 onwards you know and you know i got the opportunity to introduce che to radhanath swami at that time and uh, you know he really uh, got connected very uh, wonderfully and uh, in general his humility and service attitude could be seen through those days and uh, that is that is something which has touched me the most okay. because that reveals a person's uh, character and in 2012 we spent uh, you know at least 15 to 20 days traveling in america where he was traveling with me in different places it was almost same time may june of uh, it was may of 2012 and uh, he would one of the characteristic features uh, which i noticed in him is he would ask very deep genuine questions with the desire to understand how he can apply it in his own life and transform and that's what he's doing for the world as well exactly mm. so after you know he spent his time in the monastery he felt he could use his wisdom in various ways and that time none of us had any idea about social media and anything so then he worked for some time in the corporate after he left uh, the monastery and then uh, he learned a lot of things about social media and then he combined mm. the, the ancient wisdom with the modern technology uh, to share compassion with you know your generation and the generation next to yours to give that knowledge so i would say that 
you know if i if someone starts speaking russian i can't understand you know if someone starts speaking chinese i can't understand if someone starts speaking japanese i won't be able to understand even the best things they may be saying for my benefit so both of us would need a translator so that translator helps us understand the translator acts as a bridge so there is knowledge embedded in the wisdom it was all in sanskrit and then shila prabhupad who is the founder of iskon translated it into english and the bhakti vedanta book trust which is the publishing house of iskon translated published and has distributed 500 million pieces of heavy philosophy literature across the world mm. never before strong direct philosophy has become so mainstream mm. in terms of distribution and therefore that was the first level of translation from sanskrit at least we were able to read in english mm. and get some access but then even that english to this generation is like russian or japanese <laughs> so you need someone you know like jay and others who would help another level of translation yeah so i would say that that is a very important role which he is playing acting as a bridge mm. between uh, a certain generation and the timeless knowledge which is awaiting them so that's my take yeah. you know specifically with jay and this happens to everyone on social media but uh have you heard this dialogue it's from a batman movie you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself becoming a villain mm-hmm. anyone who just grows in mainstream media forget mainstream media in the world in general if you grow to a certain degree just people think you're a villain you know people people will find faults it's how i think the human mind is built it's how human society is built uh we're not meant to see someone with that kind of a following or that mm-hmm. kind of cloud and even when there is no faults if someone's got good intent people point fingers and try pulling you down um early on we spoke about how um your karma who right. you are as a person how you've lived your life till a certain point plays a huge role even in your material success mm. and you might be working very hard and you may not get material success because maybe your karmas aren't aligned with that level of material success and similarly you might just do a few things and get a huge amount of material success but and be truck yeah reverse the, gear the truck example <laughs> and people will say that no how could he have such a meteoric rise you know uh, jay has written all those videos which went viral he's written them himself even those ideas were gifts from the universe that you've done a certain level of work you've achieved something on a karmic level therefore take these ideas and these ideas then will therefore bring you material success that's what i've always felt about jay i never told him this myself also but i feel he had a lot of karmas which led him up to his career and i remember he had this one year i think it was 2016 to 17 where he blew up on facebook just out of the blue no one knew he was and then he exploded and that's what i always thought in my head that this person would have done a lot of good stuff before his social media career right that was part 1 of the extremely heavy conversation we had with gor gorangadas prabhu part 2 is as heavy part 2 is about even more mystical topics if you enjoyed this one do not miss out on part 2 it includes the twitter verse questions that were directed his way midway through this conversation i almost thought that hold on let's just stop the conversation right here and maybe call sir for the next conversation at some other point because the whole experience of talking to him was just too heavy that's why we split this conversation into two parts do share this conversation with your friends do share it with anyone who needs any kind of healing any kind of guidance the ranveer show has been created for that exact reason that people get free of cost online mentoring free of cost online guidance free of cost online healing make sure you follow the ranveer show on spotify every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world look out for part 2 and do spread the word about this beautiful conversation This is one of the episodes of the year for me for sure.